my business, but I make far more money uh, trading. So Ari says, Mark is a generous person. Thank you. I appreciate that, Ari. All right, so why don't we get cracking? Uh, so welcome to day one of the four-day live trade execution training sessions. Over the next four days, I'm going to just show you some insight into my pattern recognition, my price pattern, price action, trading methodology that uh, you know requires only price and time. So you'll see that I use clean, what I call naked charts. There's no... Uh, Indicators, Bollinger Bands, moving averages, uh, you know, anything of that sort. Uh, to me, a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, and I'm going to show you exactly how I set up high value trade op opportunities that, you know, allow me to capitalize on monster moves in the market. Now, you'll, you'll also come to understand that I don't need these trades every day, every week, every month. Really, if I look back, I, you know, I have three good trades a year that make me a ton of money. Now, this is a whole different way of trading, a whole different way that you've been kind of, um, you know, informed through other manipulators or marketers, as I'll call them, uh, especially in the Forex industry that are trying to sell you these, um, you know, uh, algorithmic, uh, you know, ad, you know, uh, things that turbo that, that uh, these robots that claim to, you know, trade for you profitably. And, you know, you only have to use common sense. If you could buy something for 300 bucks, that's going to trade for you profitably, you know, for in infinity. You know, I assure you that Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan would have paid that guy tens of millions for, uh, for that if it actually worked. So before I kind of get into all of that, for those of you who don't know me, let me just kind of give you a brief introduction. My name, again, is Mark Shaw's in The Pattern Trader. I started trading more decades ago than I care to uh, acknowledge or remember. But I have uh, tons of experience. Uh, you know, uh, I've written, uh, as my dad says, you know, I've, I've uh, you know, written a, a lot of, uh, you know, checkbooks in the market and, uh, you know, made a lot of mistakes. And I started the Pattern Trader to hopefully help you guys and inform you guys, you know, of the things that I've learned along the way that allow me not only to capitalize on the markets, but also avoid uh, some of the pitfalls. So I was in my, you know, second or last year of college, I was going to one of the finest business schools in the country, University of uh, Southern California out in Los Angeles. And at the same time, my dad was doing business with this investment banker by the name of Graham Loving. Now you couldn't make a you know couldn't make that name up, you know Graham was um, an investment banker by day, but he was uh, you know kind of a a trader by you know by night and by day, and he was heavily trading the commodity futures markets. Now this you know was in the late 1970s, a time where you know way before a lot of you guys probably remember, but this is where the first time where commodities were going nuts, we had. You know, uh, um, you know, oil embargoes in this country. You had interest rates going to 21%. I know nobody can imagine that now in a 1% interest rate environment. You know, Paul Volcker raised uh, interest rates to 21% to tamp out inflation. And that was the first time gold ran to $1,000. The first time silver ran to $50. You had these guys called the Hunt Brothers trying to corner the, the silver market. And it was pandemonium. And during this time, Graham was trading like 22 different markets, cocoa, orange juice, T-bond futures, uh, live hogs, pork bellies, corn, soybeans, wheat, you know, and, you know, making a ton of money. You know, by the end of, I think, 78 or something, 79, uh, my dad put in $50,000 with Graham and Graham put in 450,000. So they had a $500,000 account and 12 months later, that, that account was $5 million. So you can imagine as a kid trying to figure out what he's going to you know, do with the rest of his life, this was you know, just so exciting to, him, to me. And it was not only how, how much money that Graham was making, but how he was doing it. Because at the time I was going to, you know, again, the finest business school, and I was learning what's called fundamental analysis where you're taught everything how to break apart an investment and, and look at it from a fundamental basis. So if you're looking at a company, 
you're looking at the PE ratio, you're looking at you know, inventory turnover, you're looking at sales ratios, you're looking at the management, what we call fundamental analysis. But Graham was trading 22 exotic markets um, that you couldn't begin to you know, understand the fundamentals of, and he was only looking at price action. And when I say price action, I'm talking about really crude price action, where this was way before the time of the internet, this was um, before the time of fancy charting services. And so he would basically get a piece of graph paper and draw an X and Y axis with price and time. And every day he would just kind of draw a bar for the closing price of live hogs or orange juice or whatever. And over about three weeks, he would start getting a picture. And he would say to me, Mark, I wanna buy a market that's going up and sell a market that's going down. Now, you know, I have a mind of a six-year-old, so this really appealed to me, the simplicity of it and the visual of it. I'm a very visual person. And so I became, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, introduced to what we call technical analysis, the only, um, you know, the analysis only of price action. So we, I don't look at fundamentals. I don't hang around in forums. I don't wait for news releases. I don't wait for NFP reports. I don't wait for you know trade deficit reports based on the currencies I'm trading. I only look at price, and I create you know you know I trade across a wide variety of trading instruments. You know commodities. I trade gold and oil. I trade um, the FX market. You know the euro yen, the British pound versus the Australian dollar, and I'm actively trading the U.S. stock market, both the indexes, both individual stocks. And so I look at all of these instruments, you know, on the same basis of, you know, price and time. And, you know, over the course of the next, you know, four sessions, I'm just going to go into the live market, show you what I'm looking at and how I break up our trades. You know, I'll spend, you know, a half hour, 45 minutes doing that. Then I'll kind of open it up to your questions. And hopefully along the way, uh, you know, we'll learn a lot from each other. But before I do that, let me kind of just give you an example you know, of my trades and some of the outcomes. So this was only a week ago. This was on a, a Friday. I remember I, you know, I do this uh, master pattern session every Friday for our members, you know, who are in the master pattern. I do two hours live where I go into live markets and, you know, I look at things. And this was right on uh, about Friday a week ago. It was like, um, I, I forgot what it was, the 19th or whatever that date was. And I noticed what I call a key reversal where you see this, you know, and I'll go into the market and show you what I'm talking about, where the market makes a new high and closes on the low, you know, within the cadence of a pattern. So this was an ascending broadening price pattern. I'd spent, you know, lengthy dissertation showing an ascending broadening price pattern on pound versus Australian dollar and how it worked out on uh, XAU USD, which is spot gold, which were about three quarters of the way through an ascending broadening price pattern and how I predicted the top of the goal market using this pattern. But this is what I was looking at, you know, two weeks ago. And this was a Friday afternoon. And I started noticing that the, the, the week was going to close at the low of the week within the cadence of this ascending broadening price pattern. And so, you know, uh, this is a bearish signal. So instead of kind of, you know, uh, going short or whatever, I bought puts on the triple Qs. The QQQ is an ETF, an exchange traded fund that tracks the NASDAQ one for one. So if you wanna buy the NASDAQ, you would just buy the QQQ and now you have a basket full of stocks that approximates the NASDAQ. But I was very bearish on the NASDAQ at that time. And so I started buying these put options. Now a put option, I'm not gonna get into the weed about options. But a put is uh, something you uh, would, an instrument you would buy if you anticipate a decline in whatever instrument you're looking at. In this case, I was looking to buy the QQQ puts. Now I was buying them on a week before the 19th. So I only had a week to, you know, to list expired and I was buying it well out of the money because when I was buying the QQQs, uh, the QQQ was trading at 334 and you can see that these, the strike price was 320. So I needed about a 7% move within a week for these things to pay off. Otherwise, all of this would have expired worthless. And you can see I bought 200 of the 320s at 104. I bought 100 at about 102 and I bought 50 at 91. So an average of about a dollar 
Now, each one of these puts is based on 100 shares. So I bought 350 puts times a dollar, and then you have to multiply it by 100 shares. So I actually bet $35,500. And if I wasn't right, just a week later, I would have lost my entire $35,000. But instead, this is what happened. I got out of Summit $5.85, some at $5.75, some at $6.31. Remember, I paid a dollar for them and some at $8.10. So I, 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 my gross profit was 559% in just two days. I made $195,800. Now I did this across multiple accounts and banked well over $300,000 on this trade in just two days. And I'll go into the live market. I'll show you what I was looking at at the time and uh, you know how I was able to capitalize on that. Now, most of my members you know, who've been following me for the last six months, I've been bearish gold. This is at a time where the whole world has been bullish gold. You know, you've been told that central banks are flooding the market, that the you know, currency is going to nothing, inflation is going higher, and you need to buy gold. And I have been a seller of gold since last July. Now you can see these were a series of emails uh, going back to you know January uh, 10th, you know where I was selling it at you know 18 1867 based again on this ascending broadening triangle. This is the same one we saw on the Nasdaq uh, just a moment ago, and now you know I'll show you also on gold. So I said you know in my analysis for the last few months gold has been forming an ascending broadening uh, triangle. This is a bearish price pattern. Last week's massive key reversal is pointing in the direction gold is going lower. And you can see this was way before where gold is now. Gold's about $1,700. So this was $150 higher. And you, I said in my email, and this was all the way back in January 10th, right? What are we now? February, whatever it is. End of, we're beginning of March. So two months ago, I was saying that my target objective for gold is $1,700. That was two months ago. And then I added to the trade. You can see I put another uh, you know, sell limit at 1797. Again, talked about the ascending broadening. Uh, and this is my open trades right now. I took this you know, uh, image about an hour ago. So these are open positions. They're either gonna go up or down from here, but I have over $470,000 in open profits going short gold, you know, um, Right, whoops, I keep flipping this thing. So, you know, 1841 and 1795, and you can see at the time it was trading at 1724. I don't know where it's trading right now, you know, up or down from that. So these are my open trades in gold. This was uh, some trade calls on the pound versus New Zealand dollar where I observed a double bottom price pattern. Uh, here was another double, so I actually added to my trades, and you can see I was up about eighty six thousand dollars on pound New Zealand. You can see this was the gold trade when gold was trading at uh, seventeen seventy four. Now it's about fifty dollars lower, and that trade is still open. And you can see how I tr have these trades open for a long time. This trade was open on the uh, 9th of February, and I've still got it three weeks later. Uh, and then you know I looked at some stocks. This was um, a trade call I made in Lyft where I was buying the stock of Lyft, L-Y-F-T, at around 46 bucks. Lyft is now trading in the markets at $58. And you can see, uh, based on my beliefs, I was buying the calls in Lyft, L-Y-F-T, uh, and making a bunch of dough, also in KDOS, and then I'm also in uh, BYND. So I'm gonna discuss all of these calls. I just wanted to show you how, you know, I look at the markets and, um, So now um, I'll go into how I analyzed the NASDAQ uh, in the last week or so and uh, you know what it's doing now. So again, everything I do is just entirely based on price patterns and price action. And then you know I look at how the market confirms or, denies uh, or, or rejects my trade. 
So, you know, unlike when I first started, when I just saw a pattern, I would, you know, if I saw a double bottom or a double top, I would just indiscriminately just really believe in it. And, uh, you know, even when it was going against me, I would refuse to accept it and, you know, and fight it. And so the nuance now is that, um, is that I look at the setup and then I look at how price reacts within the setup. So, uh, whoa, what just happened there? Sorry, again, I am uh, playing with a number of different technologies here. So just excuse me if I There it is. So this was what the NASDAQ looked like. So this is what we call an ascending broadening price pattern. And it's called that because, let me just grab, because over the life of the pattern, it's ascending. And then it starts out life narrow at the pattern and then broadens out at the top. Now, when, so I use a combination of price patterns and price action. So when I observed, sorry, I'm kind of got a lot of different thoughts right in my mind right now and trying to also capture. So my trading methodology is really a four pronged analysis where the first thing is I open up a chart and I look at the, the phase or the condition of the market. You know, is the market going up? Is the market going down? And or is it turning from one direction to the other? And prior to it turning, there's always a chart pattern. So people, you know, have often said, you know, that you can't pick tops or bottoms. Sorry, I'm just writing this really badly. Um, before a market turns from one direction to another, it always precedes it with some kind of discernible pattern, a double top, a double bottom. Uh, you know, we'll go into this over la you know, the, the next couple of days. And so once I see either a phase or a chart pattern that indicates a reversal, then I look for what I, I call my insurance day bar. So what is an insurance day bar? So this is my own slang. This is just something that I coined, I owned, you know, I, I, I developed. Because to me, the definition of insurance day bar is, is a bar that puts you in the direction of the trade and also tells you or quantifies your risk. So right here is what I call an insurance day bar, where this is what I call a key reversal. So I have two definitions of a, an insurance day bar. The first thing is what I call a key reversal, where prices you know, go, go to one direction. So you could see earlier in the day, prices made a new high. And by the end of the day, prices close right on the low. Now, I just don't, you know, fire at these reversals indiscriminately. I look at them in, in, you, know, in, 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 you know, in connection with the trend or the chart pattern. So you can see all the way down here, these key reversals, where they made a new low and close on the high. Made a new low, close on the high. Not only that, but they did so right at this double bottom low. You can see there was two lows here made a low, bounce off the low, hit the low, bounced off, now you have a W. Now that's a double bottom and that's pointing you in the direction where the market's going. So I look at both the pattern and then I look at the price action. And when you get a combination like you have here, that's just gold. Now, you know, sometimes I'm very early where here, I basically looked at the daily and it also coincided with the weekly. So about the time this was making a reversal here, the, the weekly was also making a reversal right at the top of this ascending broadening price pattern. 
So when I saw this reversal in combination with this kind of bearish price pattern, you know, I, I basically bought these puts and made a bunch of dough. So this was the Friday that I bought the puts. So you can see, you know, we kind of went higher and I was picturing. So sometimes you have to kind of picture where the thing is going to go, not where it's, it's, you know, it's, it's hooking you into. So Wayne Gretzky, the great hockey player was, uh, you know, once asked, you know, Wayne, you're not the fittest guy. You're not the strongest guy. How are you able to, you know, score the most goals and do what you do? And he says, I don't skate to where the puck is. I skate to where the puck is going to be. And so, you know, what I try and do is anticipate prices within the context of a price pattern and also a price action. And so when this was kind of going up, I was loading up on these QQQ puts in anticipation that we were going to come to the lower side of this ascending triangle. And then you can see we slightly broke through here and now we've smartly come back through, you know, through here. So we may come back and retest it before we do another one of these. So I thought we, you know, would, you know, basically break it in here and likely turn lower, but you can see by virtue of today's price action, there's still a lot of strength in this market and we may just have one more move up. But, you know, what I'm trying to say is this is where I was locked and loaded a week ago and I made over 300 grand just on that move there. The other definition of my insurance day bar is what I call an inside day or a narrow range day. So an inside day bar is literally where the range from high to low sits within the range of the prior day. So you can see right here was one of those days where the range of this day the high and low of this day sat within the high and low of that day. And so I was a little aggressive. I got in ahead of that, that call just because, you know, I was, you know, buying puts and when you buy puts or, you know, options, you need to, you know, get the best price. So I just bought into a rally, but then the last part of my strategy is a trade execution component. So it's a layered plan that gets me closer and closer to the bullseye of a trade. So the first thing I do is I notice, is there a pattern? Yes, the ascending broadening price pattern. Then, you know, is there um, a, an insurance day bar? So here was a key reversal and here was an inside day bar. And then once I kind of have that information, then basically I would put a sell stop right under the low of that day. So notice again that I'm trading on a daily price chart. I'm not trading on a five minute chart, a 10 minute chart, an hour chart. And the reason I'm not is because I want, my whole objective is to make huge you know, money on big moves in the market. I'm not trying to carve out you know, 10 pips out of an intraday move based on a moving you know, average you know, crossover or some Bollinger Band or some magic you know, number that uh, you know, uh, you're being sold. So I'm not you know, trading you know, every minute you know, where I'm, 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 I'm you know, just a, a prisoner of my screen. I'm looking at these bars, how they stack one on top of the other. And basically uh, you know, I'll put a sell stop there. I'll put a stop loss above here. And this will be my risk and that will be my reward. Because basically, you know, if, if you violate this ascending broadening price pattern, it tells you that this should be the profit target. Prices should come back to there. Now I'm gonna see what happens tomorrow because uh, we went up smartly today, but I still feel like we're gonna go lower. But right now prices are rejecting that and have popped back into the trend and we may have 
one more move higher before we, we go higher. So again, this is a, you know, just a, a layered approach to the market. Maybe it'd be more clear if I look at the gold market. So I'll start by looking at a weekly chart of gold. The ticker symbol is XAUUSD. Sorry, let me. So this is um, XAUUSD right here. This is the ticker symbol for spot gold. And this is a weekly chart. Now, whether you trade gold or you trade the stock market, uh, really for the purpose of this, shouldn't matter. What I'm trying to do is you know, educate you in a way uh, to take advantage and capitalize on huge moves in the market and also avoid the pitfalls. So you can see that gold was in a huge bull trend. And all our members were long this based on a long-term breakout above 1360, which was right about here, based on a long-term inverted head and shoulders price pattern. But right about here, this is where I started telling our members to bail out, right at the top. Now, why? Why would I think you know, that you know, just to indiscriminately bail out? Now, remember, this is at a time you know, in the middle of the pandemic where you have quantitative easing, you have the world coming apart, you have all this uncertainty. And I was saying, let's start getting out of our, 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 our long positions and step aside. I think we're going to go into a consolidation, if not a reversal. And the reason I, I was saying that is, again, just based on objective evaluation of price action. So you can see in these pr price bars, again, this is a weekly chart where each one of these bars represents one week in time. And you can see each one of these price bars from low to high represented about $100 in move. And you can see before that, it was really orderly. The price bars were really small, you know, leading into that. So you kind of had this orderly movement and then you had this huge expansion of volatility. And all I mean by expansion of volatility is you can see the widening of the trading range from high to low. And to me, this just indicated a huge amount of speculation, emotional, retail trading. And this is where, you know, uh, you know, people really get caught. It's called FOMO, right? You've heard of that term, fear of missing out, where it just goes up, 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 and then, you know, starts sprinting like this. And now you haven't gotten in and you get in right there. And then you're the last person in and wonder why, you know, you always get in and the market turns. And so very difficult to anticipate that. And so you could see for six months thereafter, we kind of went in the sideways trend, but it wasn't really sideways is that you had a series of, you know, descending lows and you had what was, you know, called a descending price pattern, a descending wedge triangle. You had a series of, of bear price patterns, but you also had this ascending broadening price pattern. The same thing that you know, I noticed that was going on in the NASDAQ prior to, prior to selling it last week, where again, an ascending broadening price pattern is you have a market that's going up and then it starts life narrow and then broadens out at the top. Now, all the way, like halfway through this thing, you know, when we were, and you know, if I have a number of members on here, they'll tell you, I've been saying for six months, this thing is going down and this was my target right here. The bottom of this ascending broadening thing. I was saying it here, here, here. And, you know, I've just made a ton of dough as I showed you, I'm making almost, you know, mid six figures just holding these two trades. Now people say, well, you know, uh, how could you stay and trade so long? And the, the answer is that, you know, once I understand the pattern, the pattern gives me the confidence to stay in that trade.
So Samit says, could you explain how you decide where to start the ascending broadening price pattern? So within this collection, you know, of, of prices, so I can draw this structure, you know, I, I, you know, and look, I've been doing this so long. I, you know, I, I see all of these structures in my sleep. So, you know, I see the, the ascending broadening here. I was looking at the descending triangle here. Uh, I was looking at, you know, various heads and shoulder price positions here and here. So, you know, again, you'll just have to trust me that I've been doing this a while and I can see these things just emerging in my sleep. But, you know, what I was saying to our members is that to me, you know, prices have, like I said, I, I just visualize these things. And, and sometimes I say to our members that, you know, when I was asked, you know, if, if gold was a buy there or if it was a buy there, you know, at that time, it was just nebulous because it was kind of going sideways and, it, you know, could have gone up at that time or not. And I said, you know, I didn't because, you know, I just saw all this overhanging price action. You see, like all this price action just sitting on top of, you know, this guy here. You've got one support guy there, you know, one here you had, you know, so it's like it's like you have three 400 pound sumo wrestlers on one side of a you know tug of rope and you have like two Girl Scouts on the other. Who's gonna win that? You can see that prices, and I know I use this lingo and some people don't know what I mean, but prices just look heavy. The price action, you have a lot of price action that just is sitting here and then you have nothing to sustain you know, going the other way. So if you have all the price just sitting on top, it's like you know a, a two-legged stool. You know, you have the stool and you just have you know, two legs, eventually it's just gonna tip over. And that's what happened, gold just tipped over. So, you know, again, it's all started out with the expansion of this volatility that started to give me a visceral feel, hey, I better get out. You know, I couldn't see at the time what was going on. But then, you know, oh, you know over time, you know, I saw a series of breakdowns where, you know, in this, Thing here, you had this symmetrical triangle, and then you broke down. Then you had this head and shoulders, which looks just like a man or woman's left shoulder, head, right shoulder, and then you broke down. Then you came back up and you had another head and shoulder. And then you had another breakdown. So the gold has just been, you know, every time it rallies, it just forms another bear price pattern and then breaks down. And then within the pattern, so sometimes, you know, it looks very nebulous. And so once, you know, price action gets nebulous, then I dig within the price action and I look for what I call my, you know, my insurance day bars. Right here, you have a key reversal, made a new high and close on the low. Now, this is a weekly chart. And then thereafter, you had an inside day bar or an inside week bar where you could see the range from high to low of that, you know, key reversal inside bar. So that was a magic combination. And all you had to do was sneak a sell stop underneath there, put a sell stop there, as I instructed our mem members to do. And you had almost a $100 decline out of there. And then again, you had the key reversal, made a new high, close on the low. Now you had an inside weak bar. Now, then you had another one right here. So this is where I sold uh, my first thing at 1841, where was it? Right here. I went short right there under this inside bar at 1841 and I still own that position. So I sold it there, put my stop loss there. That's my risk. That's my reward. And so that's how, and now I'm in the, tra in the train. And people say, well, you know, do you move your stop loss? Do you move your take profit? I do. And so my take profit was 1700, but now I've moved it uh, because I think it's gonna go lower. I think it's gonna go below 1650. So I'm not gonna, you know, get in the way of this thing making me more money. Now let's say this is where you know the week ended. We would have another inside week bar. 
Now, I don't really care where these inside bars close. To me, what these represent are what I call a coil of energy, a storing of energy. So when you see an inside bar, to me, it's just storing energy and waiting to release in the direction as indicated by the pattern. And so to me, it's like what I call the beach ball effect, where, you know, picture if you put your hand on top of a beach ball and you push it lower in the water, lower, 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 what happens? It just uncorks, the energy just releases, right? And that's what, you know, these inside bars, that's why I call it an insurance bar, because you can see that here's another one where this is an inside weak bar where the range of that week is inside the range here. And so you can see if you simply put your cell stop below there, now you don't have to watch the screen. You know, you put your cell stop there, let's say the market opens and continues going higher. You're never put in the market, no harm, no foul. Now you can see this market opened and this is a weekly chart. So it could have been triggered by Wednesday now, instead of spending six hours in, sunny, you know, in front of your screen, you could have simply put a sell stop under that weekly inside bar, wait to be triggered, and now you're in a $100 move. And this is what I look to do. I look to do, you know, get you know, in the momentum of you know, massive trends that go in my favor. So I've been in this trade since 1841 right there for uh, almost four weeks now, a month. And I'll be in this trade for a long time. You know, I think my first objective is here. And then that will be a real inflection point, whether we go this or do that. Now, we can actually measure once these things break out of here, where they're gonna go to, because they're gonna go back to the beginning of the pattern. So if gold breaks, you know, it sounds crazy at this time, but gold could go all the way back to $1,200. And that's why you have to keep your emotions out of it. Now I'll go on and one, say one thing further. Now we've all been conditioned reflexively that when the dollar goes down, gold goes higher. Well, guess what? The dollar's been going down and gold's been going down. So this is why you have to look at the cold objective information as portrayed by prices. Only prices matter. Nothing else matters. So uh, Eli says, do we have a double top at the first? So yes, in a way you kind of have a double top here and not only do I look at how a market, you know, goes at a certain level, but then once it does, I look at the uh, price action. Again, this, you know, key reversal price action, you know, I'm trying to find a different color here, where you make a new high and you close at the low. Make a new high, close at the low. So by virtue of the double top price action and the price action within the double top, this was pointing. So these reversals, you know, look, it took three, four weeks of going sideways before this went in the direction. But these reversals actually point in the direction the market wants to go. The, 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 the difficulty that makes life difficult for us as traders is that sometimes it could go, you know, sideways for three or four weeks or three or four months before it goes in the direction it was pointing. But if you see what these large bars are doing and telling us, you know, you won't be faced in the wrong direction. And then you, you can use your information once you understand what's going on, that this thing is, you know, going down within the cadence of this thing. And then you can use what I call my insurance day bars, these key reversals to get in the direction of the trend and also assess your risk. So to me, that's the holy grail of trading. If you can, you know, get in the direction of the trend, so you put your your sell stop there, you put your st stop loss there. So that is your risk. And this is your reward. And if you can set up a trade with a three to one risk reward, you can actually lose over 70% of your trades and still come out a winner. So this is completely different to everything 
that you might have heard in trading. Because the way uh, most Forex systems or um, you know, algorithmic you know, EAs, they're calling, um, are set up is that they're trying to take minute trades out of the market, seven pips, 15 pips, and then you're in and out of the market five times a day. So if you're you know, trying to take 15 pips out of the market and you got to risk 10 or 15 pips uh, to make 15, you have a one-to-one -one profit objective. Now, also remember, your broker is taking two or three pips on the trade. So for every 15, you have to make 18 to just make a one-to-one. -one. And if you've just got a one-to-one -one risk reward ratio, you've got to win 90% of your trades to be profitable. And, you know, that, that's why the statistics are so bad. That's why 90, 95% of people lose their money because you cannot win 90% of the time. But on the other hand, if you have a three to one risk reward ratio, where if you're risking 50 pips to make 150 pips, now you can actually lose 72% of your trades if that's how you set up your, your trades. Because when you win, you're gonna win three times what you lose. So I just showed you, you know, something where I made 300 grand in two days and that'll pay for the party. That'll pay for a lot of poor trades along the way. And so I don't need to be perfect. And that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to capitalize on the big moves in the market. Does that make sense to you guys? Just put a comment and, uh, you know, let me see what um, you guys are saying. So Henry says, perfect. Uh, Michael says, uh, very clear. So coming in very fast and furious here. Um, so they're coming in so fast, I can't read them. So, you know, Den says a rock star explanation, uh, makes sense as Ian. Um, again, it's coming in so fast, a definite yes. Navarre says yes, Rossley. Uh, Don says you're the best. Uh, what about small accounts? It doesn't matter what size account you, you have. It, then it all comes down to position sizing. And then, um, and I should have had this open. Let me, you know, open this up and um, I'll give you a, what's called a position size calculator. Let me just copy this, put it in the, um, I'm gonna put it in the uh, chat box here. I'm gonna put a link in the chat box so you don't have to write it down. This is what's called a position size calculator. And this, it tells you exactly how to position your trades. It is what it, it's exactly what it sounds like. It tells you how big a position you have for what you're trying to accomplish. And so it doesn't matter the size. People think, well, you know, if I keep my stop loss 10 or 15 pips, then I'm being a good boy. And, uh, you know, I'm taking the right risk reward. But the thing is you can't risk 10 or 15 pips. The market swings 150 pips every four seconds. And people think, well, if I put a 10 pip, pip stop loss, then their position size is too big. So you're risking two, three, five percent on each trade and your position size is too big. So this teaches you. So let's you know, go to anything pound versus Australian dollar. Um, you can do this in any you know, currency, you know, major currency around the world. So I'm going to assume a you know, dollar account. Uh, I'm going to assume a you know, you know, twenty five hundred. Mm -hmm. You know, small account, you don't need 25,000. And this is where you put your risk. So I tell most of my traders to put a half percent risk, half percent. That's expressed as 0 0.5. And if you put a half percent risk, then it's literally impossible to get wiped out, even if you lose 50% of your trades. Now I give you 10 bad trades, you've lost 5% of your account and you'll come back to fight another day. So I could lose five out of six trades and still be a huge winner because my sixth trade will wipe out all the losses for the five. But if you're risking 5% a trade, then 10 bad trades is gonna wipe out 50% of your account. And then you need 100%, then you need, you know, um, 
you know, a hundred percent move just to come back to even. So this is why people are losing because they're risking too much on each trade. So if you risk a half, so this, this tells you what your risk is. It's not the amount of pips. This is where you calculate your risk. So it's either half or you could put 1% or one and a half or something that's reasonable that you can come back another day if you lose. So if you, you know, let's put 0.75, that's three quarters of 1%. And we're in the pound versus Australian dollar, which is a big mover. Let's say we want to risk, you know, 137 pips. And people say, well, I can't risk 137 pips on a trade. Well, you can if, you're, if you're, your uh, position size is correct. So on a um, $2,500 account, you're probably trading mini lots, which expresses you know, 10,000 units. Then you hit the calculate button. And this tells you that you can do 0.176 lots. And if you lose, you're going to lose $18.75 of your $2,500. And you'll come back to fight another day. So people always say, well, I can't follow you. I can't take advantage of the big moves you do because I don't have as much money as you. Well, that's horse, you know, you know what? You can start off with any amount as long as you use the right risk reward parameters. Does that make sense to you guys? So this business is all about discipline and risk and reward, right? Everyone gets captivated. Where do I get in the Euro tomorrow? Everyone gets, you know, captivated by the sex appeal of, you know, entry. If only I just had the, the, the best entry. Guess what? This business has nothing to do with entry because you and I both could enter the Euro versus the US dollar tomorrow. The question is once that trade is on, what are you going to do with it? And that's going to be the difference between two traders, one superstar and one who always loses. So when it goes up 100 pips, are you going to quickly snatch that profit? Or if it goes up, you know, 30 pips in your favor, are you going to snatch it? Or are you going to let it run? Conversely, if it goes against you, are you going to keep letting it go, go against you until you're praying one day that it comes back to even? Or are you going to be disciplined, put your stop loss, not even worry about it and move on to the next trade? So Rob says, why do you change contract size? Well, it depends on the size of your account. So if you have less than a, you know, a $25,000 account, you should be trading with uh, mini lots. And if you've, you know, this is a normal lot, which is a hundred thousand unit. And you probably should have 50,000 in your account. If you're trading a normal one lot, you can also do micro lots. If your broker offers it, it's a thousand unit. And so that's how you would express it. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. So typically, you know, with every one of my trades, you know, I give a, you can see a trade profile, trade risk profile. So I said on this trade, risk 0.75%. You could see I was already long. So I was adding to my trade. Uh, I was already in profits once I added. And so this is, I give you the trade risk. Then you just put 0.75% in your risk calculator. And that's how you express your risk. And you can never get wiped out. You're never going to get wiped out. You're never going to have that horror story where you got to you know, cry to your wife, oh, honey, I lost everything. You only, people only lose because they risk too much on a given trade. So people are asking, who should you open a small account with Forex? There's, you know, many brokers around the world. I don't know where you guys are. Just make sure they're all regulated. And, um, you know, and above board brokers. You can see there's a million brokers here underneath here. You can open up with, I don't know, depends where you, in New Zealand, there's, you know, there's a bunch of Aussie brokers that are really good. IG markets, um, Go markets. So you can do your own research. I'm not going to spend, uh, I'm not recommending any brokers. Uh, there's Pepperstone, there's, you know, a million brokers. So we're, I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, on that. 
So David says, I just joined your elite program and it's already working. So if you guys want, after this, you know, presentation, I'm going to play you, you know, a short video. And, uh, you know, if you want to watch it, you, you can do that. Um, can I do this type of trading in a Roth IRA? So, you know, check it out with your broker. Yes, you can. So, you know, like I said, I trade the stock market. I trade all kinds of stocks uh, on the stock market, um, uh, both short and long. You know, recently I have been, uh, you know, advising our clients uh, to go long lift. I've loved this um, chart for a long time. This is a, this uh, LYFT is the company. It's kind of a second cousin to Uber. And uh, again, all I do is I trade chart patterns. So this is the chart pattern that I was looking at several weeks ago. So like, like I said, I trade all kinds of instruments and all I'm looking for is a risk and reward relationship. So I know this is kind of you know, dull. I don't know how well you can see it on your screen. I'll try and blow it up a little bit. But, uh, you know, here is really the gist. So I look simply for a pattern that I can understand and then a risk reward relationship. So right here is a double bottom. This looks just like a W, the letter W. And when it crosses, when it makes two bottoms and then it crosses what I call the neckline, this is simply a line that is drawn through that this was your confirmation. Once it broke above there, here's your W or double bottom. Now with the word bottom in it, it implies that this thing's gonna do what? It's gonna go that way. So when I was looking at the dailies right here, it had a beautiful double bottom. I got in here, I bought the stock at around 44 and a half. I bought the options, the call options. I bought the 46 and 47 call options. And that week it closed at 53. And I made 700% on the call options and uh, a bunch of dough on the stock. So, um, you know, this is still, I think going to go higher. You kind of have a uh, diamond going on right now. But I do feel like this is gonna go higher based on, this is what I call the governing price pattern. So this price pattern is going to govern or dictate the trajectory of this thing for many days, weeks, months, and probably years going forward. So guess what? If you have a sell-off here, you know, I know to buy it. To me, any sell-off is a gift, an opportunity in this, in this thing. So once I understand the governing price pattern and, you know, what the, 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 you know, the trend is, now I know which way to be faced. So I know to be a buyer in this by virtue of this pattern. It's that simple. Even three months from now, six months from now, you know, if I get a sell-off, I'll know that this thing is still in an up phase. So somebody says, well, where's the target? Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of arbitrary. You know, it's like, this is the upper end of this thing. And so a measured move from 51 to 15 call a 35, put a $35 number on here and say, I'd say, you know, at least 86. This is going to go and make a new high. The old high was about 88 bucks. This is going to go and make a new high at some point. Now, this was the setup I was looking at just a month ago. So once I understood that huge double bottom on the weekly, then anytime you had a sell-off, to me, that was just, you know, mana from heaven. It was just an opportunity. And so once I saw this little double bottom right here, you have these two prices that came to about $44, somewhere in there. Once I saw the double bottom, and then you see here is the inside bar, this very narrow range bar, looks very benign, looks very innocent. You can see the high and low of this bar was like nothing, but it was well within the high and low of that bar. So it was an inside bar coil. 
And so all you have to do is put a buy stop above here. You can see the market gapped open and now you're in, in for a pound. So right there, I start buying the stock and I start buying the options very aggressively. The call options, the $46 call options were a dollar. I got them out at 53. I made 700%. One went to seven in a week. And I also own the stock. So now all you have is this, you know, consolidation here. But, you know, this is just, you know, building to, you know, shoot higher. So you can see you have kind of two inside bars, uh, Friday and today. You have this very narrow range bar. So to, tomorrow, I would just buy any price above here. And here was your key reversal all the way here. So this is lift, close at 57.34. I would anticipate that even tomorrow it's gonna to be higher. So it doesn't matter what instrument, you, you know, it's, uh, you know, I've looked at the, the NASDAQ stock index, I've looked at gold, I've looked at, uh, you know, the stock of lift, I trade all of it indiscriminately. So to me, the, it's not a stock market, it's a market of stocks. So you can see that I'm also short BYND. I have been for a long time. And you can see it closed at 147, right now it's trading in the aftermarket $5 lower. So even though the stock market is going higher, because you can see these triple Qs are about a hundred points higher than where they closed, I, probably because of Zoom earnings, but you can see that BYND is like $5 lower. So I trade stocks, you know, short and long. It doesn't matter. I trade only the instrument. And so this is BYND, uh, the stock of Beyond Meat. Uh, I've been short this for a long time. Quite frankly, I, I got my tick caught in a ringer uh, a couple of weeks ago when this whole... Um, you know, GoStop or GameStop crowd got hold of uh, all of these stocks with big short interest and they really ran it up on me. But, uh, you know, I really believed in the, bear, in the bearish uh, chart value here. You know, I saw the double top here and it also had like a, you know, head and shoulders here, but you can see it hit the support area and then started getting, and I was obstinate. You know, I started shorting in here with no reason to short it. I shorted in the high 140s. And then, um, you know, I went into surgery about a month ago and I didn't want to even look at my, you know, um, my account. I didn't want the stress. And so the stock went up on me to 218 during what's called a short squeeze. So uh, I did not have a stop loss, uh, fully full disclosure. Some positions I don't even put a stop loss if I feel like I really understand the position. And now I feel like this stock is just gonna get hammered. You can see that you have like this double top here and you know, now you had the, um, you had earnings release last week where it opened at 165 and closed on the low. And then you can see today we have an inside bar right here, an inside day bar where today's range from high to low literally sits within the range of Friday. And so basically if you put your stop loss, you know, or sell stop here uh, to be put in this thing, then you'll be here. And you can see in, in the aftermarket right now, it's trading about $5 lower. So it looks like it's, if it takes out this 140, it's gonna gap under all of this stuff. So, you know, I've been a very aggressive shorting it. Uh, I also bought some puts in BOI ND a couple of weeks ago. Let me just, uh, get so much nonsense open up here. Let me just try and find that if I can. I don't know where I put it. Just give me one moment. Here it is. So let me just go back. And so once I feel like, you know, I understand uh, or I can anticipate the trajectory, and this is kind of an aggressive example, 
uh, because I've been looking at this stock chart for a long time. And I think that I, you know, I really feel uh, if you look at the long-term chart, this has hit this 113 level multiple times. And to my mind, you know, when a stock, you know, or anything hits something multiple times, uh, it's going to, you know, it's going to revisit it. It's just, in, you know, you won't find that in the textbooks. It's just something that I've observed for years of trading. And even though, um, you know, we started going higher here, I just felt like, you know, this thing had to come back down. And I had no clue, you know, this thing was going to go up $100 on me. But fortunately, I had enough in my account to back it up. And that's really a bad example and, you know, not a good example to you guys. But once I saw it kind of shoot up here and then create this uh, key reversal here, where you can see on the day it made an all-time new high, it also closed on the very low. And the size of that reversal also told me that this thing was going to go lower. So then once again, the same kind of thing where I feel like once it bases out in a certain thing that it's going to revisit it. So you can see it based out, based out here. And then I actually thought it was going to, you know, crack here, but you know, when it didn't, it just, you know, kept on going higher and you can see that it closed here and then gapped up. You can see this little hash mark to the left here. This is the opening. So this is the difference between the opening and closing. It, it gapped up one day about $6. And I said, you know what, I, I don't believe it. I think this chart's coming down. And uh, again, this was very instinctive. I should have waited for this key reversal, but uh, this is where I kind of, um, it was trading at 178 and I bought these 175 puts for $2.50. Now I don't wanna you know, kind of get you guys shooting at options. They're very, very dangerous. Uh, most of the time they expire on you worthless. So I bought the 175 puts, which means that this would have to go to 172 and a half for me to break even. And I only had a week to four days to do it. I did this on a Tuesday. It was a short trading week. So I needed four days to do it. And you can see this thing plummeted from 168 all the way to 160, set 178 to 161. And I took that 250 to 1250. I made 600% on my money. And, you know, a lot of people say a lot of things. I don't say this to brag. It's just a lot of people make a lot of claims. And uh, this is what I did. This is an extract from my own account. I bought the 175 puts on BYND at $2.50. I got out for $12.35 and made 50 grand in two days. And I'm still, sh I'm still really heavily short the stock. And I anticipate this thing is just going to do nothing but go down, even if the stock market goes up. So this is an example where I think Lyft's going to go higher and BYND is going to go lower. So, you know, I just trade very objective price information, no emotion, just the instrument. So this is a, you know, stock market. This is a market of stocks, not a stock market. Some are going to go up and some are going to go down. And, um, You know, that's basically what uh, what I look to do. So you can see this is GameStop right now. This thing's been going up and down 20, 30% in the aftermarkets. And, you know, I think that'll just end in tears. That's just going to, you know, go lower. That's, you know, it's just got no fundamentals. That's a $10 stock. So um, let me take some questions and So some people like you are called stock market whisperers, like a horse whisperer, the gut instinct, which I don't have. So this is really not a gut instinct. So this, yes, there is some instinct, but it all surrounds empirical price information. So if I showed you the weekly chart, this would give you a better idea of why. Um, this is the weekly chart of BYND. So this kind of puts into perspective. So the market always throws at you um, different patterns and you got to decide which one is the, what I call the governing pattern, the one that's going to dictate the behavior, certainly over the long run. So this is the long-term weekly chart of BYND ever since it you know, went public. And right here, you have a very bearish price pattern. So I'm not, this isn't really about gut. 
This is about observation of empirical price information. So this looks just like a head and shoulders. Actually, the neckline was there. And the neckline is simply a line drawn through the pattern. And you can see once it hit there, then it confirmed this was a bear pattern. And you can see that stocks went from 140 down to 40. So if you observe that pattern, could have made a, a nice pile of dough. And then after doing that, you can see it also then put on this double bottom. So now the question is, you know, which is the governing pattern? Is the head and shoulders here or the double bottom there? So after we had the double bottom, then you had, you know, this other head and shoulders. And I thought this is where it was going to go down. Uh, yeah, I really got trapped in here. Full disclosure, you know, I thought here was another head and shoulders, but you can see it never confirmed. And by confirmed, I mean, it never really went through the neckline. You can see it never went through this low price. It just touched there and then shot up. And I should have, you know, look, this is when, you know, prices start disavowing, disavowing the, uh, you know, the, um, the chart pattern. And I was just purely obstinate. And frankly, I'm just lucky to have my head on because, you know, my head was taken off and I just decided to stick it out. I, I, I thought that this, you know, this is the governing pattern this is the governing pattern. And, you know, again, this is just part of the instinct of watching trading. To my mind, you know, it's just intuitive. If you have a stock that hits a level so many times, then that doesn't set up, you know, something that is going to be sustainable. Yes, there was this huge trajectory. I could never anticipate it. It was this whole GameStop phenomenon where people were looking for companies with big short positions and exposing them. And that's exactly what happened here. And they ran it up. But again, I just felt that it's unsustainable. If a stock, if something hits something eight or nine times, nothing will give you eight or nine opportunities over three years to get into something that goes off and then takes off and then you never get a chance to get in. That just to me doesn't happen. And so now you have this double top, you had this key reversal before the earnings came out last week. So I stayed in even after the earnings because I saw this key reversal, made a new high, close on the low. And now I feel like you're coming back here to 113. If you come back here, you're coming back there. So I feel like this will be a sub $100 stock at some point. And uh, put my money where my mouth is and I'm still short the stock. So Rod says, do you think it's time to sell SLV ETF? SLV is the silver. And I do think that, you know, silver and gold look like they are cooked, which is very, you know, inverse to what, you know, you're being told out there. So, you know, gold and silver are very emotional. They're storage of value and, uh, you know, quantitative easing and all that stuff. And so this is where you've only just got to pay attention to price now. You know, silver is much more bullish than gold. And so I've been, you know, short gold. And I would still rather short gold than silver. But I do think that you're in a very problematic area here where you see this double top here, the key reversal. You see this double top with a series of key reversals. And, uh, you know, you've kind of got this ascending line. And if you take out these prices, you're going to, you know, start breaking the momentum. And I do feel like this is setting up for, uh, you know, for tears for anybody who's long. You know, this feels like it's this. And if you kind of step back and look at the monthly chart, and this is why I really favor looking at, you know, big charts to understand what's, what is going on here. So even the monthly chart of gold told us that this was breaking apart a long time ago. So you can see this key reversal here on the monthlies, these, you know, this reversal right here, the double tops, and certainly on silver last, last month got his teeth kicked in. So this is silver. And let me just kind of put in perspective here. So this looks like a big giant bearish chart that, you know, every dog has its day and silver had this run up. This is also part of this um, GameStop crowd. They try to run the iShare silver uh, ETF up, but you know, silver is not the same as a stock. You can't, it's not really a, 
a short squeeze in the same way as a stock. So, you know, the way I look at this is, you know, you had the double top here and you kind of had this uh, long-term triangle here and, uh, you know, you broke down and all you really did was rally to, you know, the breakout area. And, you know, that's what, you know, instruments will do. They'll rally back to where they broke out from. But, you know, last month's price action, and this is a monthly chart where each one of these price bars represents one month in time. And, uh, you know, we can't really trade these things because it takes a whole month to complete, but I shouldn't say we can't. But here is this key reversal right at this juncture. So you have this top at 30, and then you have this key reversal price action where last month you made a new high at 30 and you close on the low part of the bar. So now, you know, you could just put uh, a sell stop under the low of last month's trading action, put your uh, stop loss, you know, somewhere above, you know, this high, you know, this is your risk and that's potentially your reward. You know, as crazy it sounds like, it looks like silver is just gonna crash back into its trend again. But uh, again, I, I favor being short gold over silver. Silver is a lot stronger than gold, um, but it does look like this key reversal price action is uh, gonna be a very ominous overhang. Uh, so I would, uh, if you're in the SLV, if it takes out this low, I would uh, kind of clean out of that. Sandeep says, do you consider wave theory? I just look at markets in terms of pattern and price action. I just see pattern, price action, pattern, price action. So in right in here, I saw this inverted head and shoulders, upside down looking head and shoulders, left shoulder, head there. And right here, I advise our members start buying, you know, position after position adding. And I made just short of seven figures on this position. I bought in there in the low 18s. I had uh, 2587 take profit. It did go higher. I didn't chase it thereafter. And uh, I said, thank you very much. And took out six, 700 pips on multiple positions on the observation. So markets, you know, make a pattern, they go. Now they're making another pattern, they go and you know, I will just try and get in sync. I'm just, it's really about being in harmony, right? Everything we want to do, we want to be in, in sync or harmony with the, the karma of the universe. Trading, emotional relationships, whatever it is, you want to get within the karma. And so what I try and do is try and visualize the setups and get in the direction that the market is pointing. So, you know, when a market makes a reversal, to me, it points where it wants to go. But as we saw, it could take, you know, several weeks for this thing to chop around before it does that. So even though you get the signal here, you might have, you know, six weeks later, you know, you're grinding back and forth and you're watching your screen six hours a day and going crazy. You know, I don't do that. I basically look for very simple setups and uh, price action, put my buy stop or sell stop, and then let the market do all the work for me. And uh, I don't need to win even 50% of my trades to be a huge winner. Three trades a year put me into the, you know, the plus column and then some. And so it really depends what you want out of trading. And that's really where it starts. You have to ask your, yourself the question, what is my objective, you know, in trading? And everyone will say, well, of course to make money. But really, what is it? Dig underneath it. Look at your trading habits. Are you trading in and out of the market five or 10 times a day? And if you are, you're doing it for the bump, the rush, the action. Hey, everyone loves it. Everyone loves, I love trading off an hour chart or a four hour chart or, you know, 15 minute chart and being in and out. But I just found that, you know, A, over time, uh, I couldn't win doing that. And really what it did is it robbed me of my objectivity to see the big moves. So when I look at something like this, I want to be in that. I don't want to carve out, you know, uh, 15 pips in any given, you know, uh, day here. 
you know, my objective is not to call out, carve out little. I saw a huge move. I carved out 700 pips in one trade. That takes a lot of in and out trades to accumulate that. And so my objective is to look for, you know, uh, trades that I can hop on that I can, you know, make, you know, just take huge cuts out of the market. 150 pips, 350 pips, 500 pips. I've taken out thousand pips on, a, on an individual move, sitting in a trade for um, three months. I've, I sat in the pound New Zealand uh, from late 2016 till somewhere in 2008. I, send, I stayed in that, that trade for 13 months. And people say, well, how can you stay in these trades? Your market moves around all the time. It's once I see a pattern like I do in Lyft, I don't look to see what's going on. I just understand the pattern. The pattern puts me in sync with where the market wants to go. Then I kind of look for all of my, you know, pattern trader, you know, toolkit, the insurance day bars, things of that nature. Um, that puts me in the direction of the trend. Um, sorry, I messed up something here and, uh, let me just, um, do something real quick. Um, all right. So let's see. Thanks, Marco. Cindy says, how do you determine take profit? So always the discussion of, you know, stop loss and take profit, you know, is a difficult one, not because I try and evade it is because each trade is going to have its own risk reward opportunity. So for instance, when I saw silver trading in, you know, a sideways band um, for seven years, and then I saw this setup, you know, I just, my expectation was that you were going to have a big move. You had seven years of sideways. So when you broke above here, and then what happened was that this pattern also coincided with this seven year downtrend line. So you can see right there. So the breakout of the pattern and the break above the inverted head and shoulders all were in the same thing. So you had seven years of pent up, you know, price action. And so my feeling was you're going to have a big move out of here. How big? I don't know. Could it go to 50 bucks? I don't know. So I got in here and I had initial. So I'll put it, usually I'll put a take profit like far away from the market. So I got in at 18. My first take profit, you know, could have been at 21 or $22. And usually it's kind of arbitrary. What I try and do is I put my take profit and then I see how does the market respond to my evaluation. So what I think of a market is, is, you know, it doesn't matter. It's subjective, but how does the market respond? You know, there's nothing, there's nothing more gratifying. Like when I saw that NASDAQ set up eight days ago and I put on all these puts, I, I, over the weekend, I thought I lost my mind. I, I just all of a sudden thought of what I did. I put like a hundred grand into these options that were going to expire in a week. And I needed a huge move for that freaking thing to pay. And then when I saw the, the market collapse on Monday and Tuesday, it was like, it's so gratifying to not, to see, you know, how things are setting up. And then the market shows you that it's, it's you know, going in, in the way you think it is. So once I see that the market is coming out of here and starting to respond with my analysis, then I kind of keep moving my take profit. And I moved this all the way to 2587. I actually got the top of this weekly bar, came off, then it went and made a new high. And I never got back in. You know, once I made 700 pips, I kind of just, I saw the, you know, kind of the, the amplitude or the volatility started spending gold and I never went in. So it really depends on, you know, what you're looking at at the time and then how the market responds. So, you know, but the thing is, I will, I will not do a trade unless I can see a 150 pip clear path to profitability. So that means, you know, 
I got to risk 50 pips to make 150 pips. There's my three to one. And this is the minimum. If I can't see a clear pathway, if something is just kind of going back and forth, I'm not going to play a trading range and try and play this cat and mouse with my broker and try and snatch 40 pips before it's taken away from me. I'm not taking that. I'm not, I want to see a pathway. Can I see this? And this is what I do. I do a visualization pattern, key reversal. Can I see this pathway? And if I can see that pathway, I'll take the trade risk and reward. Um, and so sometimes I'll, you know, I'll just look for 150 pips on a trade. And then sometimes if I see something that's turning, that's in the process of turning from one direction to another, then by definition, I'm going to get, you know, a big, uh, a big move. And so if I think that I, I, something's turning, for instance, you know, when the pound New Zealand was turning three, four years ago, and I thought I was going to get a big move, I stayed in this thing for 13 months. So kind of hard to see now, but. Um, so this is the pound versus New Zealand dollar, and it could be lift. It could be, you know, BYND, it could be anything. If I see a turn, so here was the turn, this double bottom. Once I saw that, I was telling our, our, our all the way here, I was telling, you know, telling all our members at that time, I was screaming from the rooftops. I said, this is going to go higher. And for three years, this went higher. So, you know, it's, uh, not easy this pair. Obviously, you can see, you know, there were big moves in between. And I took what I call counter trend trades. So even though I could see the main trend, you know, in this duration was higher, there were a whole series of times where you had a key reversal where you broke out, you broke under here, and I shorted it here. And then you did the same thing here. Did a key reversal and I shorted it here. So I will do what I call counter. If I can see enough, you know, where I can go the other way even though I recognize the main trend was higher, I'll take that trade. But that's a whole other discussion. So Floyd, again, is conflating the size of his, the account. Floyd asked the question, how would we benefit from you when we could not be sustained on three profitable trades a year as our account sizes are nowhere as big as yours? The account size has nothing to do with it, Floyd. You know, this is what I'm saying is that I got in that silver trade, you take one small position, then it, it's going your way, you take another. I had three positions before it went 700 pips. You know, but I might've been taking, you know, 2% on the first position, it got profitable, take another percent on this. So it doesn't matter the size of your account. If you have a thousand dollar account and you start with a micro lot of silver and then you, you know, build another, build another. And then all of a sudden, you know, your thousand dollar accounts goes to $1,400. And now you, you keep going from there. So the size of the account has nothing to do with it. You know, conversely, now you're kind of somewhat justifying, well, I can't, you know, stay in these trades. So I'm just going to trade five or 10 times a day and try and take 15 pips on, out on, on a trade. That's what most people are doing. And they're wondering why, you know, three months later, they've blown out most of their account. So if you're trading five times a day, you have to consider, you know, you're paying two pips. So $2 or $20 on a normal lot, you know, um, in, in the spread, you know, that's a disguised thing. So five times 20, you're paying $100 a day in commissions. And if you're doing five a day, you're doing, you know, 125, you know, trades a month times 100. You know, you, you racked up $1,250 in commissions on just, you know, so I just do one trade and I stay in it for, you know, three weeks versus in and out five times and paying your broker. So you can choose. This has nothing to do with the size of your account. I, I got to tell you, I was flat broke in uh, right around the turn of the millennial. I had a really uh, long, you know, battle with the government my, because it was something my brother did to me. I couldn't get back in the industry. I, my kid was just born. Uh, and I just started doing what, applying all my skills in the market. And I built from nothing to mega, mega uh, size accounts. 
So Floyd, it's, it's, it has nothing to do uh, with the size of your account. It's just doing the right thing consistently and not taking 5% risk every time you do it. So Kevy is com completely right. He says, if the drawback makes you feel uncomfortable, your size is too big. And Brett says, yeah, aim to make the percentage and your account will grow over time. So that's the thing. You know, if you take a half percent risk on, on, on your trades, it would take a lot of trades for you to really get wiped out, right? Half percent risk. 10 trades, 10 bad trades, and you've only lost 5%. Conversely, most of you guys are taking three to 5% risk a trade. And so 10 bad trades, you're down 50%. Now you're gonna make 100% just to get back to even. And then that's where the cycle starts. You're trying to get back to even, and now you're digging yourself a bigger hole. So risk a half a percent to trade and you'll never go wrong. So Sammy says, obviously experience counts. Uh, yeah, well, So we've got another four days together. I want to blow it all in one uh, one go here. Uh, you know, I'll keep analyzing the market, show you my thoughts. This is really, again, I just look at price and, and I'm trying to show you how I set up a trade and, you know, also kind of uh, what my inside voice is, you know, kind of doing while, you know, the markets are moving and, you know, what's happening and it all, you know, begins with objective analysis of price action. Uh, Sandeep wants to know, uh, Tesla. So this is, um, you know, Tesla is kind of a hard read. You know, I, I could see the double top up here, which led to the fall. And I hear, see this huge, you know, key reversal. Then I've got this cluster. You've got this kind of symmetrical triangle that this thing is looking like it's going to break out of. So, you know, again, the market gives you all kinds of looks where you can take pieces out of it. So, you know, I saw right at the top, you had this very nice looking, you know, double top here, which led to, you know, a nice fall. Now you've got this what I call soldier at the gate. So this thing is standing at the, the cent standing century where you have this key reversal, made a new low, close on the high. Now that's standing gateway to any further losses. And so now you've got kind of this coil symmetrical triangle going on. And it looks like, you know, you could get another move to the upside. Um, you know, you've got this long-term trend line that comes in roughly about there. So that would represent, you know, kind of a major pullback area. I kind of feel like it's still gonna get there. And you're right on a, a huge resistance line right now. So again, I can just kind of visualize and see these. So you're right at this uh, resistance level. So you could pop out of here. And then if I peel back and look at the weekly, you had this double top right here, these two reversals right at the top. But, you know, the major trend is still higher. So that's what I do. You know, when I open up my chart, I say, what is this thing doing? Is it an uptrend? Is it, a, you know, uh, what is the phase or the condition of this market? And undoubtedly, the phase or condition of this market is an uptrend. But, you know, trends do end. And when they do, they put on a pattern. You can see this little double top with the two key reversals. And now the question is, you know, is that a, a real reversal or not? So, um, you know, like I said, here's the major trend line. Probably comes back and revisits or retests that at some point. So, you know, we have like an inside weak bar going on here and uh, probably need to give this just some time. When I'm a little bit ambivalent about a trade, 
I just will, you know, just need to give it some time as to whether, you know, it topped out here and, you know, we're going to go and retest this or not. So now, you know, we'll see it's only Monday. We'll see what this week looks like. And then, you know, you can set up a risk reward around that at some point. So whenever, you know, something's kind of in the middle and I'm not sure, I just give it some more time, let it work itself out. You know, don't try and punch yourself out. Some, you know, some trades just are clearer than others. Like, you know, Beyond Meat gave me, you know, a good hook down today, what I call a hook down or key reversal. So you can see we've got this inside weak bar going on. You know, it's only, and that's the weekly. And then, you know, uh, this is the daily. So you've also got an inside bar on the daily. So again, this is, you know, I don't care what this is. I don't care if I was looking at corn, pork bellies, you know, what this is. I would look at this thing on a risk reward basis and say the same thing to myself. You know, to me, this feels, you have this major key reversal here. This looks like a funky asymmetrical double top. You know, just because the tops aren't in the same place, it doesn't matter. When you look back, this still will look like uh, probably an M top. And then, you know, here you kind of had a, you know, kind of a retreat to the breakout area and now a failure. And so that actually gives me even more confidence. So here you have a key reversal, made a new high, close on the low. And today you had this inside bar. So you can see today's range from high to low was inside Fridays. And so what I would do, and I'll tell you going into tomorrow, just sneak a sell stop underneath here. That's, you know, your position. So this is your risk. And, uh, you know, I think this is going sub 115. And that's your reward. So that's how it set up that trade. Whether it wins or loses, it doesn't matter. That's, I just objectively look at this and that's how it set up my trade. You know, it, 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 it stops me out. I'll wipe myself off and go find another trade. Uh, Joel says, do you find trading stocks versus, I just look at everything on price action, Joel. The thing about stocks is that you got a universe of 10,000. With Forex, you've got 15 major pairs, uh, which can also drive you up the wall. I mean, you know, the, you could look at stock charts all day long, which, you know, uh, I, I have, you know, I've done at times. And then sometimes I'm a, like a dog with a bone. Once I find something like Lyft, or, or BYND or something that I feel like I understand the chart, which, you know, is probably a bollocks thing to say. You should never feel like you, you know, understand anything in the markets. You should always have humility and, uh, you know, look at things objectively. But I feel like the weight of this chart is pointing lower. And now I've got all of these, you know, different things telling me that that's what I'm looking at. And guess what? I do the trade and I'm wrong. I'll wipe myself off and go look for another one. Sorry, says, please explain more about sell stops, how to place them and what they do. So I'm not going to get into, you can kind of Google it, but a sell stop is basically an order that gets triggered. It becomes a market order once it triggers. So basically a sell stop is under where the market is right now. So let's say the market's trading at 147 and you want to put your sell stop at 146. And so, you know, if the market goes up from here, your sell stop never gets triggered because the market never went down and hit it. And that's the beauty of it. You know, you don't have to watch the market. You don't have to, you know, you know, sit in front of your screen till your eyes are bleeding. You basically put your sell stop in and walk away. So let's say you want to get in this thing. You put your sell stop in and if it hits 146, then it becomes a market order when triggered. So you could be, you know, filled at 145. So you can actually do what's called a, a stop limit where you can designate the stop price at 146 with uh, a limit price of 145, which means that you can't be, if the market you know, hits this and then just hits a flurry and the next price is 128, you may miss be being put in there. But I'm, I'm overcomplicating it and you can Google all this thing. But a sell stop order is an order that resides under where the market is and requires the market to confirm it by running into it that way. So that's a sell stop. You know, conversely, if you wanted to put a buy stop, you'd put a buy stop above you know, where the market closes and it would require the market to go up and hit it 
uh, at which point it would become a market order. Uh, these are just execution ways to you know, set up an execution that you know, once you've done all of your work, so you analyze, here's the pattern, here's the you know, reversal, here's the inside bar. I feel like the market is going lower. I wanna get in this thing. Now I don't look for some 15 minute chart with some Bollinger band when it crosses the 15 minute moving average. You just you know, put it under the daily bar. This is why I look at daily bars. And then you know, if the market takes off from here, you're never put in. Conversely, if the market puts you in, now you're automatically put into a trade that you know, is going in, in you know, your direction. So it starts with, you know, what is this market doing? Well, I think it's in a downtrend. Is there a pattern? Here's the double top. Is there, here, you know, is there an insurance day bar? Here's the key reversal. Here's the in, you know, inside day. Then I layer it with a sell stop that puts me you know, in the direction of the trend. And then it just requires the market to put me in. So the market opens up tomorrow, you know, you know, you have to watch it. And then, you know, at some point, you know, just before the market closes, all of a sudden it falls, puts you in the market. And then all of a sudden, and that way you don't even have to, you don't have to work. The market does all the work for you. And that's my philosophy is that I look at the setup, put my trade, you know, execution in there and let the market do all of the work for me. All right, guys, I'm going to love and leave you there. Uh, I'm going to play you a short video. Um, I'm going to see if I can find it. Yeah, so uh, stick around uh, and uh, watch this video, and I'll see you tomorrow at 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Sorry guys, hang on one second. Um, this is a new technology to me and um, I'm not quite sure why it's not playing. I've already created the ideal solution for you. Now I'm going to introduce you to my daily journal. On a real basic level, it is a daily email that I send to my inner circle of traders. This email contains the exact trades I'm looking at, where to enter, where to exit, and how much to risk on any given trade. This radically simple yet effective system of delivering scientifically tested trading results Or you have years of experience as a struggling trader, or you don't have a good knowledge.
do like the Dow Jones Industrials. Thank you, you are a gem, Marta. Now, before I reveal exactly how to sign up to become a Pattern Trader Elite member, I'd like to throw in a few bonuses. The first free gift you'll be receiving is the Pattern Trader Advisory. Every single week, I'll send you a 15 to 30 minute video analysis of the markets. This will give you hands on. Hi guys, uh, sorry, I um, try to play the video and um, can you guys hear me? Okay, yeah, you can hear me. I, uh, yeah, I don't know what happened. Uh, I'll try and get it working for tomorrow. Um, Hi guys, uh, sorry, I um, try to play the video and um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, it's, it's, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get this technology straight and uh, something is not uh, happening here. So I'll try and get it working by tomorrow. So I'll see you guys. Um, I'll see you guys tomorrow at four o'clock Eastern time. Thanks guys.